My name is Mubarak, and this is En Masse. It was 30 years ago when China first opened its door to the outside world and started on this really amazing journey of economic reform that has led it to be one of the poorest countries in the world to now the world's second largest economy. A central component of that were special economic zones. And they started with that in places like Shenzhen, which is now... Welcome to episode four of En Masse. So today I basically wanted to delve into a topic that I think many people think about when they first get interested in socialism or communism that question being whether china is still socialist or still a socialist country in the present day the party has the name communist party of china their flag is red and xi jinping the leader of china might even reference marx or the word socialism in some of his speeches and or writings some Marxist Leninists, not all, consider China to still be socialist, and a lot of other people don't consider it to be socialist, but for many different reasons, usually very liberal reasons, like, you know, authoritarianism, or like they call it a dictatorship, or something vague like that. This question is of utmost importance, considering it speaks to how we should understand the developments and changes that happen within societies, and different forms of societies, and and what that entails and what that means. You know, as Marxists, Leninists, or Maoists, or even people that simply wonder this and don't ascribe to any tendency, we should very much be concerned with having a position on this question. As annoying as, you know, certain leftists can be and being so like obsessed with things happening in other countries instead of trying to build revolution in their own country, I still think that this question is important to have a correct view on in order to actually understand how even in your country how certain changes occur and how capitalism develops or or what it even means to have a revolution and what it means to continue having a revolution assuming your initial revolution was even successful so having a correct stance on this for the right reasons is usually a sign of being closer to a revolutionary way of thinking that sees communism as a necessity and not just an interest or hobby if we consider ourselves to be internationalists, we should also be very aware as to what's going on elsewhere to the best of our abilities. Sometimes it's easier than other times depending on which country we're looking at and what information actually sees the light of day. But with China, I think that there's more than enough sufficient evidence and proof that depicts the realities on the ground internally in China and in terms of China's relations with other countries. Anyways, to begin, I wanted to discuss how we should even approach this topic. And in order to do so, I'll be largely referring to a number of different pieces, all of which I'll make sure to link wherever this episode ends up being posted. One in particular that I'll be quoting in length a little bit is Rethinking Socialism by Pao Yuching and Deng Yuan Su. And this is one that I also mentioned in my interview with Rev Left Radio. First off, we have to ask the question, you know, what does socialism or communism even mean? And what's the difference between socialism and communism? A lot of people tend to use the two words interchangeably, and they think that the two words mean the exact same thing. Therefore, some people will say, you know, the Soviet Union was communist or China is communist. And sometimes people use socialism to refer to social democracy as opposed to what they think is communism which they see as any party that adheres to militancy in any way, or that is Leninist or Maoist or what they might wrongly refer to as Stalinism, which isn't really a useful category in any concrete way. Therefore, a socialist state is bound to have elements of capitalist society as well as of communist society, but it seeks to eliminate the capitalistic elements in order to make the full transition. Communists do this out of necessity given the destruction inherent in capitalism and not merely due to choice. Some people say that Marx used the words socialism and communism interchangeably, and this is actually true. Sometimes he used the two words to vaguely describe the same thing, and there are two problems with this argument in terms of like trying to figure out what the meaning of it is by simply looking at Marx. Because we should base our definitions on how societies actually grow and actually change historically and not solely based on what Marx said. And secondly, even Marx, 
understood that there's a lower stage of communism as well as a higher stage of communism. He did make this distinction. Therefore, in this description, the lower stage of communism is what we refer to as socialism, this transitional phase to quote unquote higher stage of communism or a more developed form of it. So yeah, the lower stage of communism is basically what we refer to as socialism or revolutionary socialism, or, you know, dare I say it, real socialism, quote unquote. With that said, we'll get into the characteristics of these different kinds of societies as we progress. In the piece Rethinking Socialism, the first sentence of the piece says, Socialist transition is the period of time that transforms a non-communist society to a communist society. What's being said here is that socialism is a process, like, as I, like I've already said, not merely a thing that you can look at like a tree and say that's socialism, but it's inherently a movement or a societal motion. Therefore, it makes sense that this societal motion will have particular characteristics and phenomena that determine where this motion is headed. If it is objectively moving towards communism, a stateless and classless society where the workers own the means of production and control the means of production, then it's socialism. If it's moving towards capitalism and this has to be determined by looking at all aspects of the society, then it's capitalist or revisionist. And that's the difference between the two movements. The forms of capitalism it can revert to if a society begins a socialist transition can also be different. There's different kinds of capitalism also. You know, there's more free market capitalism like we see in America, but then there's also state capitalism like we see in China today. Some Nordic countries have adopted this model to certain degrees too, in terms of like a more state capitalistic approach. Socialism aims to move towards a stateless and classless society, and this entails certain things that we will mention in the next quotes. During the socialist transition, there is no certain predetermined path by which policies and events can be judged to determine whether this path is being followed. Instead, the analysis of socialist transition depends on the general direction of the transition. Therefore, one single and isolated event cannot determine whether the transition is socialist or capitalist. We have no predetermined path in mind and, thus, have no specific yardsticks to measure our evaluation. As Lenin said, we do not claim that Marx or the Marxists know the road to socialism in all its completeness. That is nonsense. We know the direction of this road. We know what class forces lead along it, but concretely and practically, it will be learned from the experiences of the millions who take up the task. There are, however, some general and broad guidelines on the direction of transition towards communism. Most generally accept that socialism, or what Marx called the elementary stage of communism, is a stage of development when the direct producers gain control of the means of production and distribution is made to each according to his work. Under capitalism, capitalists own the means of production and direct producers have no control. Since the purpose of production under capitalism is value valorization, capitalists must relentlessly extract as much surplus value as possible from the workers. The purpose of production under socialism, on the other hand, is to produce products of use value to meet the needs of the people. Thus, socialism represents a fundamental change in the capitalist relations of production. It is the antithesis of capitalism. These general guidelines give the direction which is a developmental process of transforming the relations of production from commodity production to non-commodity production. Correspondingly, there have to be fundamental changes in the political, social, and cultural aspects of the society. The social transition is by no means a smooth one. It is marked by many twists and turns. Expected setbacks and retreats occur. However, the general direction is always clear. Due to certain circumstances, retreats are sometimes necessary before advances. In such cases, the reasons behind the retreats should be clearly explained. End close quote. So that quote is from Rethinking Socialism in the first segment or first paragraph. So a few things here. One, we can't simply look at one isolated event in a society to determine whether it's socialist or capitalist or whatever ist. 
In order to get a whole picture, we need to examine as much as possible economics, culture, politics, etc., etc., how they interconnect, and this is what I'll be attempting here. Secondly, although there's no predetermined path for us to follow towards communism, like, you know, there's no complete perfect guide that someone like wrote 2000 years ago to reach this kind of society, there are certainly certain things that can help us make a correct analysis. The goal of socialism is to produce things for what are called their use values, which literally means making a thing for what it can or should be used for. For example, making a pair of headphones in order to listen to music, or making a pen to write, etc, etc. Since the beginning of human existence, we've created tools in order to use them, and this is a pretty simple fact in all kinds of societies. Under capitalism, however, we still use things, but capitalism adds a kind of new dimension to a thing. Capitalism turns things, or useful, productive things, into commodities. A commodity being anything that's bought or sold on the market or in the market. And this adds a new dimension to a thing which is called its exchange value, i.e. what it's worth if you were to exchange it for other commodities. This exchange value expresses itself through the medium of money. This new dimension of exchange value, and I'm simplifying things here for the sake of being brief, is largely why people are starving all over the world while food is rotting on shelves because nobody is buying it. You know, things are produced to be exchanged in a capitalist economy first and foremost. You don't get a thing unless you have another commodity to get that thing. But yeah, things are produced to be exchanged in a capitalist economy first and foremost, and their use value gets largely negated in this process. If nobody buys a piece of cabbage on the market, it, it rots on the shelf while people are starving all over the world and on the streets. The same goes for a hammer, right? It'll sit in a plastic case for however long it has to until somebody buys it. Even though there's somebody that needs it, but because they might not have money or whatever means to get it, they won't get it. Whereas socialism attempts to produce primarily for the benefit of human development overall and not in order to maintain exploitative capitalist relations. For a more in-depth understanding of this, you can read Capital Volume 1 by Karl Marx. Therefore, under socialism, we seek to move towards communism which would be producing things for their use value instead of because it can be exchanged for something else. This means you produce lettuce to be eaten, not simply to make money or to gain X commodity. Again, I'm simplifying things a little bit, but you get my point generally speaking. With this in mind, socialism should be, gradually, the elimination of producing things merely for exchange or value with a capital V as it's sometimes referred to. This doesn't mean socialism won't have any money, but that the money relation as well as the exploitative social relations associated with it should gradually decline and cease to have a basis to exist since society would be organized in a fundamentally different way. This also entails that workers would have control over what's done with that which they produce. Instead of CEOs and boards of directors or state capitalists making all the decisions while the wage slaves toil without any collective or democratic input. This would also entail a political and cultural apparatus that emphasizes moving in the direction of communism, which would be producing not for just profit, but instead to meet the needs of the population at large, not merely to accrue more capital for a wealthy minority, which is what we have under capitalism, even in the richest capitalist economy and the richest capitalist state you have poverty you have just like things that based on the amount of wealth that the country accrues shouldn't be there in the sense that you know if things were distributed and organized in a fundamentally different way then that could be a possibility whereas we don't have that possibility under these current conditions communism then would mean the eventual abolition of money and people would produce things to benefit society at large. I don't think this means people won't trade anything or, you know, give one thing for another, but that the logic for trading things would be for benefiting all the parties involved instead of attempting to kind of rip off or best the other party, which is what we have today in terms of how the market works. This transition doesn't happen by the press of a button, but there are certainly certain steps that need to take place before you can even begin to transform a society. 
In order to do that, you need power. You need the ability to make decisions and policies that actually have an impact on society. This entails taking state power due to the simple fact that socialism needs to be able to protect itself. Remember that socialism is the antithesis of capitalism. It's the complete opposite of it. Therefore, capitalism will defend itself with armies, weapons, sanctions, so on and so forth, in order to not die. Capitalism is a self-perpetuating system. You know, a mode of production consists of people, you know, real people with real interests that benefit from its existence. And they will do anything they have to do in order to maintain their benefits. We've already seen this with the Soviet Union being invaded by many countries and being demonized while it existed. Even when it was revisionist, it was still a contending force to U.S. imperialism. So therefore, it still had to demonize it. And this exists for basically every single socialist or communist state or even social democratic states that were more Marxist Leninist in their orientation. Like, you know, this is kind of the case with Venezuela and a few other countries. But anyways, this is why communists aim to take control of the state in order to facilitate the transition from one mode of production, capitalist, to another, communist. I won't go into depth on this question for this episode, but it should be noted that the big difference between communists and anarchists is that anarchists don't think taking over the state is necessary. They simply want to destroy the state and build communism from there. They also tend to favor a more spontaneous approach to reaching this goal instead of the approach communists take via organizing as a vanguard party that helps lead and engage with society via a correct application of what's called the mass line. I also think it's undeniable that a proletarian state and a capitalist state are not fundamentally the same. Historically speaking, the dictatorship of the proletariat has so far been the most effective counteroffensive to capitalism on a worldwide scale. One is dictated by the proletarian class and its party, so long as the party is applying the mass line correctly, and the other is in the hands of the capitalist imperialist class. The Soviet Union was invaded by the entire capitalist world after 1917 when the Bolshevik Revolution was successful. This is also why communists and other leftists are persecuted all over the world. Unsurprisingly, they usually go for the communists first, but this is a question for another episode. Regardless, as communists, we should accept that the state apparatus exists for one class to exploit and oppress another class. This is Lenin's contribution to Marxism, basically this understanding as the state as an apparatus for one class to oppress and suppress another class. And this is the case under capitalism where the state is literally used to shut down strikes and, and force workers to go back to work through back to work legislation. Sometimes workers get shot in certain countries, sometimes beaten, shot with rubber bullets, tear gas, whatever it is. In the case of a society based on slave labor like Rome, the state exists for the slave-owning class to exploit the slaves, under feudalism for the feudal lords to exploit serfs, and under capitalism it's for the capitalist class to exploit the proletariat and the working class. Therefore, in a socialist society, the proletariat and a revolutionary proletarian party aim to oppress and eliminate the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie. And sometimes it, it, this distinction isn't so clear. In the case of China, for example, there was also a feudal class. And in, in a lot of semi-feudal countries, there's usually a kind of feudal aristocracy or, or vestiges of feudalism that still exist that kind of dominate over peasants as well as the proletariat in different ways. But more accurately, socialism aims to eliminate the capitalist relation. Whether on the ground of politics, culture, production, etc., etc. One of the ways it begins this process, assuming a revolution has occurred, is through nationalizing all of or most of the industries and enterprises within a nation or country. This means the state, being controlled by a revolutionary communist party, has to nationalize industries or the means of production in order to begin the transition to socialism and later towards communism. Because all communist parties that have taken power have done this, this leads many people to think that state ownership in itself is socialism, and that's incorrect. This is just like a kind of initial stage to take power and then foment or create, foster the transition towards communism after that point. 
this isn't you know as easy as i'm saying it this is a really difficult task right you have to deal with ideological and backward ideas that people have incorrect ideas that people have in order to kind of guide things and go along but this has to be done in a very deliberate way to be successful in the essay rethinking socialism they kind of outline the fact that state ownership of the means of production does not automatically equate socialism meaning that just because the state or government owns a significant amount of a country's enterprises it doesn't make the state or country socialist the state taking over the means of production is certainly a crucial stage for a socialist state to begin redirecting how things are produced but this alone doesn't determine whether said country is socialist or not socialist many capitalist countries have state owned enterprises to varying degrees it's actually a liberal error to conclude that a state is socialist because they control a significant amount of the economy's production liberalism and conservatism generally speaking are very idealist in that they view social phenomena as very static Therefore because the Soviet Union, China, and other countries had a necessary stage of state ownership of the means of production, they wrongly suggest that this stage in itself is socialism or communism. And this is incorrect and this error is kind of what leads people to consider Scandinavian countries to be socialist countries or why some people even say Canada is socialist because there's universal health care and certain things are nationalized and this is completely incorrect you have to look at every aspect of the society you know also its role in imperialism and and just it, it, this doesn't even scratch the surface in terms of describing the mode of production that's most prevalent within a country or nation but anyways this goes back to the error of kind of looking at isolated events in order to determine the character of a particular country or state It's also an error that isn't grounded in a historical materialist approach that tries to look at a society concretely and basing its definitions on those concrete phenomena in motion. You know, things are moving, they're not just static and stay in one way forever. That's not how it works. So it doesn't suffice to say that X country is socialist because they control X amount of enterprises, regardless of if the leading party has the name socialist, communist or not. We also have to look at the nature of the production relations or social relations in these enterprises. In a capitalist enterprise, let's say one that is state controlled, the state hires the manager or executive director, CEO or whatever you want to call it, and they make more money than the average worker. Not only that, but they're kind of there to facilitate the exploitation of the workers on behalf of the state. It doesn't matter whether the state calls itself communist or capitalist. If this is the nature of the production relations, you know, prevailing in society, then it's a capitalist enterprise and not a communist or socialist enterprise, or it's a capitalist country and not a socialist or communist country. It can only be a socialist one in this situation if there's a deliberate attempt being made to undo this worker-capitalist relationship and the workers are actually learning to manage and control their enterprises collectively. This would be moving towards workers owning and controlling the means of production collectively. Interestingly enough, after the Bolshevik Revolution had won its civil war and the CPSU solidified itself as the leading party, Lenin proposed that they put in place what was referred to as the new economic policy in order to rebuild their economy after it was devastated in the civil war. Essentially what happened after the Bolshevik Revolution was a period between 1918 to 1921 that's referred to as war communism. In this period, Lenin concluded that there were many errors that had taken place in respects to the communists handling the contradictions between peasants and the proletariat. And there were many other aspects to this too, but I'm not going too in depth. So many Bolsheviks had assumed that they could jump directly to communist relations after the revolution and this caused a lot of economic and social problems to arise a lot of the bolsheviks thought it would be possible to jump directly towards communism without carefully assessing what needs to be done in order to adequately prepare for building socialism this led to a lot of peasants you know which was the majority of the population being disgruntled with the bolshevik party which makes it easier for them to align themselves with their landlords and those that exploit them and this also meant that they were aligning themselves with 
the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries or SRs who were super like kind of petty bourgeois middle class, upper middle class interests that were using kind of revolutionary rhetoric to gain support from these people. And, and they did in a lot of cases. This new economic policy or NEP meant that the government would tolerate a certain degree of capitalist relations and private ownership in order to prepare itself for building socialism. This meant that they allowed some capitalists to run enterprises and businesses in a capitalistic fashion. And a lot of these managers and, and capitalists also got bonuses and things that you would see in a typical kind of capitalist enterprise. And I don't want to go into whether this was a good idea or not in this episode, seeing as that's an episode in itself, but I wanted to focus on Lenin's conception of what was happening in this period. Lenin fully understood that this activity was what is referred to as state capitalism, and he separated this from being socialism proper. To take this further, he saw this as taking a step back from building socialism in many of his writings after the revolution. In one of Lenin's reports entitled The New Economic Policy and the Tasks of the Political Education Departments, he clearly states in discussing this new economic policy, which he deems necessary that, and I quote, the surplus food appropriation system in the rural districts, this direct communist approach to the problem of urban development, hindered the growth of the productive forces and proved to be the main cause of the profound economic and political crisis that we experienced in the spring of 1921. That was why we had to take a step, which from the point of view of our line, of our policy, cannot be called anything else than a very severe defeat and retreat. Close quote. So it's apparent here that this retreat was essentially a retreat from building socialism or moving towards communist relations of production. Socialism was still their ultimate goal, but based on the devastating effects of the revolution and the subsequent civil war, they deemed this retreat necessary and understood it to be state capitalism and not socialism proper, at least Lenin did. A part of the reason why the peasants were disgruntled was because the Bolsheviks didn't do as good of a job mobilizing peasants as they had mobilized the proletariat. The Chinese Revolution actually did a significantly better job of organizing peasants and handling those contradictions between town and country more adequately. With that said, I would still argue that the Soviet Union in a political or rhetorical sense was socialist during this time because they still had the intention and goal of building socialism and this was also right after the revolution so we can't assume that drastic transformations would have occurred as soon as possible as that would have been a bit unrealistic in my opinion, especially while a war was happening and had just concluded. Whereas, you know, with modern day China, it's been independent for close to 70 years now. So you can't really use that argument to say that China is doing what, you know, Lenin did in 1921. But even so, in a concrete materialist sense, they were enforcing state capitalism and not yet socialism. And Lenin made this apparent. And he even wanted to make this clear to the, you know, workers and people that supported the Bolshevik revolution and the Bolsheviks, you know, people that were in trade unions and different kind of workers organizations. China also went through a similar stage. Mao said in 1953, after they had fully taken power in 1949, when referring to China, and I quote, the present day capitalist economy in China is a capitalist economy which for the most part is under the control of the people's government, which is linked with the state-owned social economy in various forms and supervised by the workers. It is not an ordinary but a particular kind of capitalist economy, namely a state capitalist economy of a new type. It exists not chiefly to make profits for the capitalists, but to meet the needs of the people and the state. True, a share of the profits produced by the workers goes to the capitalists, but that is only a small part, about one quarter, of the total. The remaining three quarters are produced for the workers in the form of the welfare fund, for the state in the form of the income tax, and for expanding productive capacity, a small part of which produces profits for the capitalists. Therefore, this state capitalist economy of a new type takes on a socialist character to a very great extent and 
and benefits the workers and the state. And close quote. So, this statement from Mao is also very telling since he and Lenin seem to have a very concrete understanding of their conditions in their countries and had not yet begun their socialist transition and their economies were state capitalist and not yet socialist in 1953 for China and 1921 for Soviet Russia. Interestingly, Mao sees the benefits that the workers were receiving to have a socialist character, but he never said that this alone makes the economy fundamentally socialist. Again, when referring to social democracy, a lot of people make the error of assuming that social democratic states are socialist when they simply have a tinge of socialism due to workers having more benefits and concessions given to them from the ruling class. This is also incorrect just because like, usually, like, Almost every single social democratic state usually benefits from imperialism, especially if we're talking about Nordic countries, like in Scandinavia with Norway and Sweden and things like that. For it to be socialism, there must be a dictatorship of the proletariat. This is also telling because the welfare fund being referred to here, or what was called the Iron Rice Bowl in China, that gave workers guaranteed jobs, benefits, health care, and more, was one of the first things that Deng Xiaoping's leadership took away after 1978, after Mao died in 1976. These benefits were even further dismantled when China became a member of the World Trade Organization in 2001. It wasn't until 1958 when the Communist Party of China instituted what were called People's Communes that socialism, in a concrete economic sense, really began to permeate and develop. The production relations in these communes was fundamentally different from a capitalist enterprise, and we'll go into this more in detail shortly. Now, I want to get into the question of revisionism, before going into production relations during the Cultural Revolution. We've looked briefly at what socialism is, what communism is, and what capitalism is, as well as state capitalism, and how it may or may not be a state capitalism moving towards socialism and then communism, so now I think we should look into the question of revisionism as it pertains to socialism and the concrete transition towards communism. Revisionism in a basic sense is when so-called Marxists or communists attempt to revise certain principles of revolutionary communism. This happens ideologically when communists suggest that opposing classes within a society can be reconciled or when they suggest that the antagonism between the proletariat and the capitalists are no longer antagonistic, or that we can somehow reach a communist society via purely peaceful means. This is also sometimes referred to as right opportunism, or when communists basically shift towards a more social democratic, liberal understanding of socialism or communism that ends up undermining socialism. In an economic sense, that is tethered to the ideological expressions I just referred to. Revisionism takes the form of a socialist state transitioning back into a capitalist state. In other words, when socialism, the transition towards communism, reverses into transitioning back into capitalism. I'm going to quote Rethinking Socialism again just a little so that you get a clear explanation of what I'm trying to say. We believe the question of revisionism should be determined by the direction of transition, instead of whether the state still owns the means of production or still practices state planning. Capitalist transition, i.e. revisionism, begins when the state machine reverses the direction of transition from socialism-communism to capitalism. This does not mean that, at this point, the revisionists are able to complete transforming the relations of production from socialist to capitalist, the transformation itself takes time, as we have witnessed in the former Soviet Union, in Eastern European countries, and in China. In addition, we cannot judge the direction of transition by examining one single policy or one isolated event. Instead, policies have to be evaluated in totality. We introduce some new concepts, capitalist project and socialist project, as tools for our analysis. The goal of capitalist projects is towards capitalism. Capital projects are concrete ways to establish, to maintain, or to expand the capitalist relations of production and to establish, to maintain, or to reinforce the dominating and dominated relation 
between the owners of the means of production and the direct producers. The purpose of production in capitalist projects is value valorization. If the state is able to continue implementing capitalist projects in a consistent way during the transition, it will eventually remove the direct producers from having any control over the means of production or the product of their labor. By expanding the capitalist projects, the state, or private capital, is in a position to speed up its capital accumulation by extracting more and more surplus value from workers. The distribution of a capitalist project is based on the size of capital, constant and variable, not on the amount of work contributed. Diametrically opposed to the capitalist projects are socialist projects, whose direction is towards communism. When the direct producers will have control over the means of production and the product of their labor, under socialist projects, the distribution will be, at first, according to the amount of labor contributed with serious consideration given to meeting the basic needs of people. Later, when productive forces are fully developed, distribution will then be made according to need. Socialist projects are projects designed to enhance the long-term class interest of the proletariat, and they are not the same as the so-called social welfare programs in the advanced capitalist countries. Socialist projects are economic policies or programs derived from political decisions. This is the meaning of what Mao said about politics in command. Socialist projects are designed to restrain, contain, and interrupt the accumulation of state and or private capital. We need to emphasize here that a socialist project is not simply an economic program. It includes social, political, and ideological aspects. In fact, all these aspects cannot be separated from one another. The same is true for a capitalist project. Moreover, the socialist project is not something with certain fixed and unchanged features. Rather, the socialist project itself has to go through fundamental changes during the transition towards socialism and communism. Close quote. What's interesting here is that when they mention the development of productive forces towards communism, in a socialist transition, they mention that it should be subjugated to the socialist projects. In other words, the communes and or other forms of socialist projects should shape how new methods of production and technologies are created and utilized, and that this should be the material basis for communism. The logic used by revisionists, however, is that this has to be done via the capitalist project before we can change the social relations somewhere in an unforeseeable future, assuming they mention social relations at all, which they usually don't. Another thing we need to recognize is that historically, the contradictions that exist in society, like the contradiction between capital and labor, or the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, also causes splits in the ruling Communist Party itself. No communist is exempt from being influenced by revisionism or capitalism. We're all indoctrinated with capitalist ideology in a myriad of ways and therefore should never be fooled into thinking that we could ever be pure. With that said, we can always strive to be mostly correct or, you know, mostly always correct. But basically, in the Communist Party of China, when they were still revolutionary or in the CPSU from 1917 to the death of Stalin, there were always contradictions in the greater society that influenced the ideological developments in the subsequent communist parties. All of these political differences were also fairly apparent even before their revolutions were successful in taking state power and thus continued in different ways afterwards. This line struggle, or the struggle to properly assess and act on the contradictions that exist in society towards building communism, is interconnected with the general progress or regress of the class struggle. And in China, I'll be arguing since 1978, capitalism has been fully restored. I'll talk a little bit about the initial transitions that occurred in the Deng Xiaoping era and then finally flesh out my argument of China as it currently exists. One of the telltale signs of revisionism that occurred after the death of Mao 
was the Communist Party of China declaring that the Cultural Revolution was over. During the period of the Cultural Revolution, beginning in 1966, the government allowed for authority to be openly criticized and this was apparent in a document entitled the 16-point decision that was drafted in the same year, 1966. This opened up the opportunity for the masses to criticize all forms of authority and even China's past. This certainly led to some unnecessary destruction of historical sites and the likes at times, but what's crucial was the potential that was unleashed by Mao's supporters in the Communist Party. Bourgeois writings on the Cultural Revolutions only look at the quote-unquote chaotic or destructive aspects because they don't grasp the significance of that tumultuous period as it pertains to the global class struggle. They even forget that bourgeois history is founded on the glorification of wars and the necessity of wars or chaos that ultimately benefited the ruling class, whereas this chaos, like the Cultural Revolution and some of the things that occurred there, benefited the working class ultimately. The fact that such a large number of the masses supported and engaged with the Mao-led initiative also displays his correct application of the mass line during this period. This came from a fundamental understanding that the masses or the people liberate themselves and the Communist Party's job is to foment and foster that revolutionary potential and not to crush it. Even if it leads to some excesses, which certainly did occur at times during the Cultural Revolution, but have to be understood in the context of China's imperialist and feudal past. Not to mention some of the mishaps of the Great Leap Forward that created some of the same problems that the Soviet Union had struggled with when it came to the development of a revisionist line in the party. Like I had noted earlier, it's evident that even within the Communist Party that there will be a rightist or right deviationist political line that represents the seeds of capitalist restoration and or revisionism. In China, this right deviationist faction was led by Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. The Cultural Revolution, on an economic level, meant the fostering of communes and more socialist or communist-oriented production relations or socialist projects. Mao made an effort to emphasize the formation of these production relations saying that, and I quote, their advantage lies in the fact that they combine industry, agriculture, commerce, education, and military affairs. This is convenient for leadership, close quote. Mind you, this was said in 1958, so Mao had held this proletarian line way before the Cultural Revolution had even occurred. What Mao is suggesting in that statement is that the workers were engaging in a new form of production relations that was counter to capitalism. You know, the workers were engaged in commerce, they were figuring out how to actually manage their enterprises, uh, they were building their own tools and new kinds of tools based on the new kinds of production relations. So like the, the, the seeds of communism in a sense were fostered here and, and that's really important. Under capitalism, generally speaking, you know, you kind of go to work, you die for eight or more hours internally, you have no say as to what really happens, and then you go home. Not only that, but you're usually unaware of what's happening behind the scenes when it comes to financial decisions, decisions that ultimately affect all workers. You know, capitalist relations also creates an artificial division between work and quote unquote real life, the latter being when you're not at work. It fosters a sort of like dissociation or alienation that I think is a very real phenomena for someone who works the average job and, and you know, I've, I've experienced this myself. Many of the factories in this period of the Cultural Revolution also had schools within them that allowed for the development of particular skills. There was maternity leave for pregnant women, daycares, doctors on the job, and conditions overall were improving for workers during this period due to their voices being heard and due to the fact that they were able to manage their own workplaces. You know, all of this also included a sort of welfare fund for those workers in the factory that were old or had certain disabilities. So even though under socialism, it's based on, you know, how much work you put in is how much you get in a sense. Overall, that's not completely true. There were still kind of these safety nets for people with disabilities or for people that weren't able to work as much as everyone else due to whatever, you know, condition they had, and, and that was fine. 
During the Cultural Revolution, many revolutionary committees were formed and these committees basically served to link the party, the army, and the revolutionary workers into one body. With this, there were representatives of these revolutionary committees in many factories that understood that politics was in command. Therefore, it was understood that all workers should be engaged in political discourse on some level and that proletarian politics fostered these kind of socialist or communist projects or enterprises. This is fundamentally antithetical to capitalist enterprises, which only focuses on economics in a crude way that only serves the capitalist class. You know, under capitalism, it's like you can't really see what's happening behind the scenes because once you see what's actually happening and where money is being siphoned off to, then you, you will realize that you're being ripped off. And we already know we're being ripped off, but creating this kind of barrier between how the place is actually managed and the work you do on the floor is what kind of helps to veil or kind of mask what's really going on under capitalism. Interestingly, prior to the Cultural Revolution, production was generally focused on only producing quickly and efficiently without a genuine concern for the proletariat or peasants. This productivism, which is what that's called when you kind of only focus on production and, and technology and kind of put that stuff over the needs of the people, you know, was also characteristic of the Soviet Union and was a sign of a right deviationist line taking hold of political affairs instead of a revolutionary line. Even Stalin, like later on in his life, kind of capitulated to these kind of ideas more, more, you know, deeply than was the case when he was kind of fighting Trotsky over the idea of socialism in one country. And, you know, in Stalin, you kind of see different ideas, even in Marx, which I'll kind of go into a little bit later. You can see these different ideas of like productivism, you know, this emphasis of technology on technology and technological development. So, yeah, this productivism or primacy of the productive forces thesis was also discussed in my first episode with J. Mufawad Paul on Maoism. It's a line that subjugates the class struggle or the masses to economics and production in a very crude way. Instead of seeing class struggle and the masses as fundamentally the motor of history, instead of seeing technology and development as fundamentally positive no matter what the social relations are. This is a point to remember for the second part of this episode as it's characteristic of capitalists, liberals, and revisionists to hold this productivist view. I'm not suggesting that economics doesn't matter. Obviously, people need to eat, work, etc. But it's incorrect to reduce all of society to economics and not recognize how the superstructure, quote unquote, superstructure of society, you know, culture, politics, and etc., feed back into economics and the perpetuation of certain economic relations or production relations. We shouldn't see these phenomena as abstracted from one another or suggest that economics or technology alone determines all that happens in society. Anyways, I discussed briefly the economic and production relations that existed during the Cultural Revolution, so now I'll talk about some of the cultural aspects that developed in conjunction with the social relations that I just mentioned. I've already mentioned some of these cultural aspects briefly, but generally speaking, authority no longer held the sway that it did in the feudal or capitalist era of China. Teachers were allowed to be, you know, criticized by students, big character posters critiquing party officials were popular, the masses were producing politicized art and products of their own will, politicians or landlords were sometimes even beaten up by masses of people, etc., People were quoting Mao left and right, and this also created an echo that spread across the globe. You know, China's feudal past was being criticized and seen as reactionary, etc., etc. You know, the Black Panther Party was actually known for selling Mao's little red book, and Huey P. Newton said his revolutionary conversion was actually heavily influenced by reading Mao's work on the Chinese Revolution. What's also interesting in this relationship between the black power movement and China during the revolutionary era was that Mao's later revisionism, one of the signs of this being when Richard Nixon visited socialist China for the first time, and when Deng Xiaoping was allowed back into the party, also signified the budding revisionism and reformism of the Black Panther Party, 
Huey Newton formulated his theory of intercommunalism, which basically rejected the understanding that black people in America constitute a nation within a nation or an internal colony. I'm not suggesting that Mao or the Communist Party alone caused the whole globe to be revisionist. There was many factors internally and externally, but that throughout the history of communism so far, all of the parties and movements are interconnected. Therefore, whatever happened in the Soviet Union always had an effect on socialist or communist parties worldwide. And the same went for China due to its influence globally, and this is undeniable. But generally speaking, this was the aura of revolutionary sentiment that encompassed Chinese culture during this period, and that is no small point. We don't see anything of the like coming out of China today on this scale, and instead, China produces movies like Wolf Warrior 2 and kind of reproduces bourgeois culture in many ways. It certainly differs from what we see in the West in certain ways, but the similarities are apparent in terms of consumerism and the like. Now, after the death of Mao in 1976, there was a sort of final battle between the revisionist capitalist rotors, which is what Mao called, you know, Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi during the Cultural Revolution, and leadership in the party that stuck more closely to Mao's understanding of China's affairs. This took the form of a standoff between Deng Xiaoping and his supporters and what was known as the Gang of Four. I'm not going to go into depth here, but merely want to give a general sense as to what occurred. What happened during this period was that Deng's faction successfully and actively suppressed the Gang of Four and ended up dominating China's political affairs. This would signify a major turning point for Chinese socialism, doing a kind of 180 and transforming China into a capitalist society. It should be noted here that these leadership shifts and ideological shifts characterized the kind of general contradictions that inevitably take place in a socialist society as well as a capitalist society, this generally being the struggle between proletarian power and capitalist power. These names of individual leaders and their internal party conflicts represented movements in the class struggle in China at large. And this is proven by the support that many of the masses and workers gave Mao throughout his leadership. Therefore, the proletarian line in the party lost to the bourgeois line in the party after Mao died and the Gang of Four was defeated by Deng Xiaoping and his supporters in the party. Mao and his supporters in the party simply fostered and strengthened the revolutionary sentiments that had already manifested themselves out of the capitalistic and feudalist social relations that had existed in China prior to and after the revolution. Mao didn't create the Chinese revolution single-handedly, nor did the Communist Party do it single-handedly, but they did it correctly by analyzing the concrete conditions and acting to create a society that does away with those contradictions that exist in capitalist society or attempts to move towards or move away from those contradictions. And in this, there were mistakes and some great successes made of world historical significance that we all need to understand and study. But more importantly, we need to practice based on the lessons their experiences provide us with. After the revisionists seized power and Mao's supporters were repressed and purged from the party, the revisionists put in place a number of policies that would be the foundation of China's restoration of capitalism. You know, the socialist projects and enterprises or communes were virtually wiped out. Workers' benefits were virtually wiped out. The party went back to emphasizing worker discipline and productivism in full swing. A number of the benefits that workers had received through the iron rice bowl were pretty much wiped out. The revolutionary committees were wiped out. The gang of four were criticized and the cultural revolution was demonized. Liu Shaoqi, who was one of the foremost revisionists during the Maoist era, had his image rehabilitated by the Communist Party and China. Therefore, we should be clear to see this transition for what it is. I'll be sure to link all of my sources wherever this episode gets posted. You know, to cap this segment of the episode off, though, I'll quote Xi Jinping himself and his views on the Cultural Revolution. You know, it should also be known that Xi Jinping's father was also purged from the party during 
the Cultural Revolution, and his image was also rehabilitated by the party. So to quote Xi Jinping, we must further free our mind, further release and develop the productive forces, and further stimulate and strengthen the vigor of society. The three furthers put forward at the plenary session are both objectives and conditions of our reform. Freeing our mind is a prerequisite or the ultimate switch for releasing and developing the productive forces and strengthening the vigor of our society. Without freeing our mind, our party would not have been able to make the historic decision to shift the focus of the work of the party and the country to economic development and launch reform and opening up shortly after the 10-year turmoil of the Cultural Revolution, ushering in a new era in China's development. Close quote. So it's clear here that, you know, he's emphasizing the productive forces. He, he kind of just glosses over the Cultural Revolution as turmoil, doesn't mention communes or anything positive that might have assisted the transition towards socialism. And it's pretty clear as to what the kind of ideology permeating in the Communist Party of China. And, you know, it's, it's just obvious. Also, in one of the footnotes in this work discussing the Cultural Revolution, it's briefly said that the Great Cultural Revolution, or Cultural Revolution for short, refers to the political movement wrongly launched by Mao Zedong that lasted from May 1966 to October 1976 and was participated in by the general public. Therefore, it's evident here that there is no sober view of the Cultural Revolution whatsoever that exists in the Communist Party of China today, and this leads us right into the next segment. I just wanted to use this segment of the episode to say thank you for all your support. If you're interested in donating or helping out with On Mass Podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash on mass podcast, or you can go to on mass podcast.com and you'll see the Patreon link on the side somewhere. But yeah, thank you. This episode's a little long, I know, but I asked people if they wanted it to be two hours or two one hour episodes, and most people said they wanted it to be two hour episodes, so that's why I chose to make it two hours. All right, so now we've taken a look at the past a bit, but only so that we may understand the present conditions. Today, if you turn on the news, it's apparent that China is a major player in global affairs. Since 1976, their economy has grown substantially. You know, there's a burgeoning middle class in China. They're doing some work in attempts to move towards green energy after they've polluted the hell out of their atmosphere or the atmosphere. They've opened up their markets to the world in imports and exports. They've exported some capital to Africa and in other countries in the global south. And they own a portion of America's debt. There are millionaires and billionaires in the Communist Party of China, so on and so forth. You know, and because of all these phenomena, there are different opinions that exist as to the role China is playing globally and whether it's a positive or negative role. Liberals see China as negative because it's a quote-unquote authoritarian state with one-party rule. Some liberals see China as potentially positive since it's opened up its markets, so they're hoping that bourgeois democracy somehow ends up being the culmination of that. Conservatives tend to see China as negative due to it being another potential threat to American capitalism and imperialism worldwide. Some revisionist Marxist-Leninists see China as positive because it's focusing on developing its economy and because the party has the name communist, they think that this suffices for it to be a socialist society. And of course, they completely ignore production relations and completely overlook the Cultural Revolution and Mao's battle against these capitalist rotors that took power after Mao died and then instituted these reforms. Anyways, as a Marxist-Leninist Maoist, however, you know, positive would mean that they're playing a progressive role towards establishing communism through their dictatorship of the proletariat. And this comes out of a revolutionary communist view that communism is a necessity if we want to begin building a better future for humanity 
So this will be my point of analysis that is informed by the general trajectory of the communist movement and the class struggles globally and the lessons that come out of Marxist, Leninist, and Maoist reflections of those phenomena. So we've discussed some of the changes that occurred in China during the Maoist era and the subsequent changes. So now to build upon that backdrop, let's look at China as it developed in a sense out of those developments. To do this, I want to engage directly with some of the works that see China positively since I don't want you to only hear my opinion on the matter, but to have a critical view of what I'm discussing and what I'm suggesting. To begin, I'll be referring to the China in Africa podcast, which looks specifically in events pertaining to China's relationship with Africa culturally, politically, but mostly economically. The podcast is run by one Eric Olander, and he has a co-host who's named Kobus Van Staten, and I would characterize their opinions to be of a liberal bent, but one that is definitely sympathetic to China's interests worldwide. You know, they don't take the kind of typical Western China is evil, China is doing everything bad approach. They're actually, you know, trying to be objective and things like that, but they are ultimately coming from a kind of liberal outlook without question. You know, I've listened to their show for years and they certainly don't critique China from a simplistic Western imperialist point of view, but they're ultimately still mired in liberalism when it comes to their understanding of economics and politics. The episode I'll be playing clips from, from their show, involved them interviewing a journalist by the name of William Davison, who is a freelance journalist that focuses on Ethiopian affairs. In this episode, they attempt to look specifically at how Chinese capital is affecting Ethiopians. So I'll just get right into it. Was, uh, 30 years ago, when China first opened its door to the outside world and started on this really amazing journey of economic reform that has led it to be one of the poorest countries in the world to now the world's second largest economy, a central component of that were special economic zones. And they started with that in places like Shenzhen, which is now the, the, the southern capital for startup tech, where the home of Huawei. And, uh, and you could never have imagined 30 years ago, and I was in Shenzhen, 30 years ago. And it was this poor you know, fishing village. And today, of course, it's a city of 10 to 12 million people. And a lot of it is being credited to the creation of these industrial parks or these special economic zones that they did. Now, more and more, the Chinese seem to be taking that model and wanting to prescribe it in other countries. And particularly in Africa, there's this idea that creating special economic zones uh, in places like Mauritius, in Nigeria, uh, and in Zambia, uh, will help the economy there just as it did here. But there's a, an offshoot of these special economic zones, which are oftentimes tax-free, and they're, they're immune from a lot of the regulatory burdens that confront other parts of the countries. Um, there are these industrial parks. And again, we're going to find out today a little bit the difference between special economic zones and industrial parks. But the bottom line is that the Chinese model is being attempted to be adapted in places like Africa. So basically what's being said is that China's special economic zone model which was characterized by them opening up their markets to foreign capital. And this was kind of at the beginning of the neoliberal era. And by markets here, I mean Chinese labor. You know, they allowed their working class to be exploited by Western imperialist powers in order to get some technology and to get some investment into their country. And that kind of helped their development. And this foreign investment has been one of the main reasons as to how China has developed its economy since 1978. This allowed them to access more advanced technology from Western countries. Now they've been able to kind of emulate and develop their own technologies as well. We've all heard about the stereotypical factory in China where workers are super exploited, working long hours, and working conditions are simply appalling. Sometimes these stories are sensationalized by Western media in order to pepper the image of Western imperialists and pretend as if they don't play any role in that exploitation when they do. But that doesn't mean that there's absolutely no truth to those stories. I find it pretty annoying when Marxist-Leninists, at least ones that are pro-China in particular, simply denounce an entire story because Western media is trying to use it instead of trying to find the kernel of truth that might exist in those stories 
and separating it from its propagandistic garb. The reality is that many Chinese workers, especially in these industrial parks and economic zones in China, are super exploited. The only reason Foxconn or Apple or whatever other company would send their factories to China in the first place is because the labor there is cheaper than in their imperialist home countries where capitalism has existed longer and wages are higher due to the you know, maturation of the class struggle or concessions given. This is also partially due to being imperialist nations and because the class struggle under capitalism in those countries were affected by Keynesian reforms that partially benefited the working classes to thwart revolutionary sentiments. What's telling about these special economic zones or SEZs is that nobody can argue against the fact that these are in every way capitalist enterprises run by private capital. Therefore, the production relations are fully capitalist in all aspects. Even if these enterprises are state-owned, an SEZ being exported to somewhere is because you're trying to exploit somebody's labor. So now we should ask, why is China trying to export this model to Africa? And, and I'm really going to be quoting Helen High here, who actually has a connection to Ethiopia. For those of you not familiar with Helen, uh, she is the former vice president of the Huajin Shoe Company, which is one of the largest shoe manufacturers. And they set up uh, a major manufacturing facility in Ethiopia, in some ways the poster child of Chinese outsourcing to Africa. And she talks about how China will be exporting 85 million jobs in the coming years, in part because environmental regulations are going up here in China, the cost of labor is going up, and also because manufacturers want to be closer to the markets they're serving. So, listen to the reasons he's outlined here. Labor costs are rising in China, environmental regulations are being implemented within China. These reasons are pure capitalistic and imperialistic reasons as to why any country would want to export its capital. The majority of China's population is beginning to get old, which also has many implications as to why they're looking at Africa, which has a very young population overall. This is the exact reason why capital was exported to China from the Western imperialists, and now China wants to super exploit African workers to benefit itself. Yet we have so-called Marxist-Leninists suggesting that China is still a socialist country, and on the environmental front, why is it that China is making changes for their own country, but yet they're okay with polluting African countries? Another aspect of them trying to invest in African countries is the fact that they're not being subjugated to having to pay taxes to the state of those particular countries. So this is the basic handbook or textbook or straight out of the textbook of any other imperialist or capitalist nation. So tell us a little bit about the life of the workers and the people who actually work in these facilities. And are they living up to the hype that the government and people like Helen High are promoting? In terms of the Chinese manufacturers um, and the Ethiopian government, um, the Chinese manufacturers are, are very much looking at the um, relatively cheap costs of production in Ethiopia, which is some of the world's um, lowest wages, which is some of the world's lowest electricity costs. Um, and that combined with the attractive investment package in terms of cheap, um, cheap rent, um, tax holidays, and also the tariff-free access to European and US markets that you mentioned. Um, so that's the, that's the side of the deal from the Chinese companies. I think part of this package is that while jobs are being created and the investors are being attracted, that is because of the very low wages that the jobs pay. So there's a, you know, there's a contradiction there or there's, you know, there's a tension. You cannot provide the jobs and get the investment if the jobs are paying good wages. So there really is a, you know, a clear sacrifice being made by the Ethiopian government and by Ethiopian workers. They can only get the investment if the wages are kept at a certain level. Now, is that working for the Ethiopian workers? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, the people I spoke to, you know, they were some of them were glad to have moved from the countryside and to have a job, but others realized that the job wasn't all it was cracked up to be. They were struggling to meet living costs because of the increase in, um, in, in house rent that had come with the influx of workers. So there was, you know, there were definite problems for some of them. 
Um, and obviously, a, you know, a lot of Ethiopians, particularly people who are opposed to the government, are not happy with this strategy to sort of roll out the red carpet for foreign investors, which they see to be at the expense of a very underpaid Ethiopian workforce. Like, I mean, listen to this sincerely. Chinese capital isn't exporting socialist or communist enterprises here. They're exporting capitalist enterprises with the aim of extracting as much surplus value as possible from the developing proletarian class in Ethiopia. There's no concern here for workers to control the means of production. There's no concern for them to manage their own production like we saw in the Maoist era. There's absolutely no socialist or communist character to what we see here. And instead, we see what every other capitalist imperialist nation has been doing to poorer nations since time immemorial. So for somebody to see this as positive, as a communist, means they've completely adopted capitalist ideology and are revisionist. This isn't even a debate anymore. Maybe right after Deng Xiaoping and the revisionists took power, you might have been able to argue that capitalism wasn't fully restored in China, but this is just absurd at this point. I mean, I even talked to an activist friend of mine who was part of the Economic Fighters League in Ghana, West Africa, and he said it's apparent that China is a growing imperialist power that is exporting capital, and many Africans have been reacting to this trend for a time now. In 2017, just last year, the city of Tema in Ghana saw workers striking against the Chinese company China Harbor Engineering, which is a subsidiary of China Communications Construction. And mind you, this is a state-owned enterprise, not just some rogue Chinese capitalist running this enterprise. The workers argued that working conditions were poor, they aren't being adequately paid, and that the Chinese supervisors have no respect for them. This entire dynamic lacks any socialist character whatsoever, especially when the Ghanaian police shot rubber bullets at the striking workers to quell their strike. In Ethiopia, it should be noted that the Ethiopian government used to be a revisionist Marxist-Leninist government, but now considers itself to be a quote-unquote revolutionary democracy government and completely got rid of the Marxist-Leninist in their name. Interestingly though, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1990, there was a general trend wherein almost all revisionist Marxist-Leninist governments shifted even more to the right and adopted social democracy in practice and sometimes even in name. This has also been the case of the CPUSA in America and the Communist Party of Canada where I live. Another thing to note is that there have been discussions about to what degree certain African countries or governments can adopt the Chinese model. And sometimes Rwanda is used as an example. But I would argue that the only reason why the Communist Party of China was able to coax the working class in China to a certain degree is because they never overtly rejected socialism or Mao's image. Even though they reject socialism and the Cultural Revolution's successes in practice, they still mention socialism and even Marxism-Leninism in some speeches if you dig hard enough. They just use the revisionist phrase, socialism with Chinese characteristics or market socialism, which is kind of an oxymoron. This was also characteristic of the Soviet Union following the rise of Khrushchev's leadership after Stalin died. In reality, it's capitalist imperialism with Chinese characteristics, and that's all. Unsurprisingly, after Mao's death, you had a kind of demonization of the Cultural Revolution and some of Mao's activities. And after Stalin's death in the Soviet Union, you had a complete you know, repudiation of Stalin and a complete repudiation of everything he did while he was the leader of the Soviet Union. So there's that parallel there. The difference being that in China, they couldn't demonize Mao as much because the Chinese Cultural Revolution was actually successful to a certain degree in connecting the party with the masses. Therefore, you can't completely, fully, you know, demonize Mao when he has so much support, which is partially why, you know, maybe certain Chinese workers and certain Chinese people might still have you know, allegiance to the Communist Party, even though it's taken a huge revisionist swing. And there are many people in China that are part of leftist organizations that consider 
the Chinese government to be fully revisionist. And if you do enough research, you can actually find a lot of information on these groups. And sometimes their websites get shut down by the Chinese government because they don't want these messages to get out there. It should also be known that China has also began to export its military into Africa also, particularly in Djibouti, which unsurprisingly shares a border with Ethiopia. They've also, you know, been doing some military exercises and things like that in Nigeria. It stated that this base that they've exported to Djibouti is to function for humanitarian purposes, but I'm sure we've all heard that before. I'm sure it has nothing to do with protecting their economic interests on the continent. Although China isn't yet as big as America economically or, or militarily, it's without a doubt that it's a rising imperialist power that is mastering the neo-colonial form of domination or what they refer to as soft power. Can you give us an idea of who these workers are? Like my, my stereotype of them would be you know, a young woman who just moved from the countryside, possibly from some form of subsistence agriculture uh, economy into the, the, a first manufacturing job, possibly with with relatively low levels, probably primary school level of education. As, am I just making that up from, you know, like UN commercials or is is that a realistic view of, of who they are? No, I think that's, I think that's a reasonable stereotype. Um, it was interesting to see at Hawassa that, you know, Hawassa is a big, a big city um, in Ethiopian terms, but they were recruiting from a hundred mile radiate, radius of Hawassa. So they were looking to recruit from rural areas and, and smaller towns um, where there's generally an even higher unemployment problem. And, but there is a range of jobs at Hawassa Industrial Park. So, you know, graduates from Hawassa University can find themselves into, um, into supervisory positions. People who are graduating from technical colleges from Hawassa or, or surrounding cities can move into sort of machine operating roles. Um, but anyone um, essentially um, who applies can find themselves into a, a, you know, a, a basic position working on the production lines or, or cleaning. So, you know, there's, there's a range of, of, of people, um, but most of the people are from the areas surrounding Hawassa. Um, most of them will have um, some form of education um, some of them will have, uh, have had tertiary education. The only thing that comes to mind from hearing about people in the countryside moving to urban centers to seek employment is a process of primitive accumulation, a feature of a developing capitalist society, which is in this case, Ethiopia. And China has no problem facilitating this in other countries because it's already developed its own variant of capitalism and now seeks to feed its own capital by exploiting African labor. This is why we should recognize that China is state capitalist. There are full-blown millionaires that are capitalists in the Communist Party. Some people hear this thinking it's cliche, but the significance of this is that there's a well-developed state bourgeoisie in China. I've also given a historical account, so I'm not just saying this in the same kind of empty, isolated way that people tend to say it in. Millions of dollars don't merely come from working hard, as liberalism would lead us to believe. This is also funny because I've seen some people attempt to argue that there are instances where foreign capitalists or Chinese capitalists even have been jailed or had their activities mitigated. There are certainly instances one can find of this happening, but even capitalist countries attempt to mitigate what they deem to be corruption and sometimes companies aren't allowed to merge into monopolies in order to keep the market competitive. There are many instances of America cracking down on foreign capitalists and interests within America, for example. This is a feature of capitalism self-regulating for its own national interests. Not all Chinese capitalists are in the Communist Party, which is why the majority of them that have been subject to arrests aren't members of the party. Although there has been, in subsequent years, an attempt to get rid of some corruption and things like that, it should be noted that there's a huge difference as to how Xi Jinping is going about getting rid of this quote-unquote corruption versus how Mao did it, where Mao actually used the forces of the masses, the force of the masses, against the party itself, whereas Xi Jinping is doing the same old thing that we see with capitalism, where it tries to self-regulate itself via the same state apparatus that has produced this corruption. You know, sometimes these people even serve prison time in the West that are, you know, these foreign capitalists or sometimes even domestic capitalists. And 
The capitalist system also regulates itself to varying degrees and China is no different. Even if there are cases where workers themselves lash out at foreign capitalists, we have to ask what happens when they lash out at China's domestic state capitalist class. There are a myriad of examples of labor activists and people sympathetic to Maoism being repressed, jailed, and more in present-day China. There are also bound to be contradictions between state capital and foreign capital since they're also competing with one another and China isn't unaware of Western imperialism seeing China as a threat. And Western imperialism does want China to collapse. It does want China to fail in order to maintain its hegemony. So it does try to use sort of like liberal tendencies within China or sometimes in Hong Kong in order to kind of undermine the Communist Party of China and undermine its existence in order to not have that competitor in China. So we, ha we do have to keep that in mind as well. But that doesn't mean that every single Maoist in China, every single leftist in China that thinks China is revisionist is false or wrong. That is just too simplistic of a view. We have to have a class struggle, concrete analysis to understand that these trends in any kind of societies, whether socialist or capitalist, it means that there is a class struggle going on between a proletarian line and a bourgeois line. And that's what we're seeing in China. Maoists are actually not even allowed to rally in China and many go to Hong Kong for that reason and have been actually pushed out of the country to Hong Kong due to repression. Here I'm referring to the Mao Zedong Thought Society, which celebrates the anniversary of the Cultural Revolution every year. You know, capitalist and imperialist nations always have conflicts with one another, and that's all that we see playing out when foreign capital is allowed to be attacked in China by the state or when the state allows workers to attack foreign capital. When people make this argument, they also ignore the many instances of labor activists and revolutionary groups and revolutionary minded groups that are even just leftists being repressed and detained in China for going against capital that's party owned and managed. If you listen to my interview over at Rev Left Radio, you probably heard my tirade against Ajit Singh's argument that China is a socialist country. So I want to look at some of his arguments on Rev Left more carefully to make his revisionism apparent. And the revisionism of people that have this opinion apparent. I think, yeah, the general view amongst Western leftists is uh, after uh, Mao Zedong passed away um, and when China initiated uh, reform and opening up economic reforms in 1978, they abandoned socialism for capitalism. And my position is that China is still a socialist state. Uh, it is still pursuing socialist construction um, and that its communist party is a revolutionary communist party. And also aside from that, I also try to engage with as broadly as I can progressive people and argue that even if you're not concerned with whether China is socialist or if that's like not relevant to you, I think it's still a progressive trend regardless of what you think of it in the world. So I think first I'd like to talk about like, just so everyone's at least on the same page, uh, what is a socialist society? Um, and not, there's very like there's hundreds of different sources you could get a quote from or from whatever. Um, but I think in I refer to the critique of the Gotha program by Marx, uh, where he says between capitalist and capitalist and communist society, there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of one into the other. Corresponding to this is the political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat, in contrast to the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie under capitalism. Also, what we deal with isn't a communist society emerging from its own foundations or, or in like this free, perfect world. Um, we're dealing with a socialist society as it emerges from capitalism, from feudalism, from uh, imperialist domination. And in every respect, it's it's marked by this, Marx says. It's still, quote, stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. Mm -hmm. And we don't reach the higher phase of communist society until we build the material basis for it until the productive forces have also increased such that we can reach from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. So there's a trend among many revisionists where they simplify every critique of China or other previously existing socialisms to becoming merely from Western Marxists. This goes to show that these people have not engaged whatsoever with the works of Maoists that have been released in India, Philippines, Philippines, 
uh, Nepal, Peru, and more. It's simply a dogmatic inability to engage with anything other than one's own opinion that leads to this form of unprincipled ignorance. He begins the argument in defending China as socialist by quoting Marx in the Gotha program, where Marx emphasizes the development of the productive forces to build socialism up to a higher stage. Mind you, if you read Marx or Engels, you'll most definitely find arguments of a productivist character, and arguments where he places the class struggle as the central motor of history in opposition to that productivist argument. Both of these arguments exist in Marx's writings, which is also why we shouldn't read Marx like the Bible and look at how history actually unfolds in reality. Interestingly enough, in Marx's historical accounts like the 18th Brumaire and the Civil War in France, he tended to center the masses and contending historical class forces as the primary movers of history, and I think this is fundamentally correct. Some comrades have struggled with me on this in the past because when I first got into MLM, I still had some pro productivist understandings and tendencies myself, and it became more apparent to me after this struggle that it never has been that technology caused society to move forward in any way. It was always social relations that ultimately created and determined how those technologies would be used, and this is no insignificant point. I think that it's obvious that any socialist or communist state would need a military apparatus and still have to develop technology, but the fact is that that technology should be in the command of a revolutionary political line that is fundamentally socialist and communist in character and deliberately trying to move towards communism at all times. This doesn't mean there won't be any minor setbacks, but the general tendency should be moving towards communism. And in China, the general tendency has not been that since 1978. This revisionist argument that we need technology and development first before we can change social relations is in large part why the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc no longer exist and because they fomented capitalism, which hindered the progress of socialism. It would also be absurd to suggest that China, quote unquote, wasn't ready for developing communistic social relations and had to retreat to capitalism to develop itself first before it can fully build the lower stage of communism or socialism. Many of the communes in China during the revolutionary era were actually very successful, and even the ones that weren't successful, the point of instituting those socialist projects was to learn new ways of management and production that were fundamentally different from capitalist ways of production and capitalist social relations and capitalist technology and all of that stuff. The point is to learn from the successes and failures to strengthen new methods and slowly eradicate capitalist relations. Feudalism didn't merely collapse because capitalism had more technology. That would be a ridiculous argument. It largely collapsed because of the class struggles and contradictions between the bourgeoisie and feudal interests internal to whatever state or nation that we're analyzing. Mao's China by no means was attempting to abolish capitalism overnight during the Cultural Revolution, but rather to strengthen and foster the development of contending socialist or communist projects to deliberately eliminate said capitalist relations. This is also a bad argument considering we don't determine what socialism is by merely looking at Marx's critique of the Gotha program or any other book. We determine it by looking at the world historical developments and regressions that have occurred in the global communist movement. You can use those texts in order to learn about those things and to refer to reality, but ultimately reality is the point of analysis. You know, the reality is what we're trying to analyze and books and things like that are supplementary. This is frankly a form of idealism and book worship that is removed from concrete historical developments in China or elsewhere. And so while there were great leaps in egalitarianism um, in improving living standards, it was still a very, very poor society given where it started from. This is due to imperialism. And so one would expect if these reforms constituted a counter-revolution that this should, this should look like a counter-revolution. And what we see in terms of counter-revolutions in the former uh, socialist countries in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union is the greatest population loss in modern history as the economy was hollowed out, privatized, uh, social supports were cut back, 
you had issues with people's lives becoming just far more brutal and living standards decreasing. You also had lots of migration contributing to this because this decrease in living standards. And so in China, what do we see? We see a country that has averaged nearly 10% uh, GDP growth per year for 40 years straight without crisis, without the capitalist boom and bust. This comparison of the Soviet Union's collapse and China's economic reforms is quite sloppy here. On the one note, uh, you know, the Soviet Union was about 72 years old when it collapsed, and China is just reaching close to 70 years old as we speak. I'm not suggesting that the Chinese Communist Party will collapse in two years, but that it's not even as old as the Soviet Union was when it collapsed. You know, that that kind of complete collapse hasn't happened with the Chinese Communist Party as of yet. It can happen. It may not happen. But the restoration of capitalism has still occurred. And that's not untrue. You know, China has also been a lot more careful in its involvement with other countries, whereas the Soviet Union, even when it was revisionist, was very overt in creating its spheres of influence in opposition to American imperialism. It's sloppy to compare the collapse of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union to the revisionist reforms that Deng put in place during 1978. What would be a more accurate and concrete comparison would be to compare the revisionist reforms put in place by Deng in 1978 to the reforms put in place by Nikita Khrushchev in the Soviet Union following the death of Stalin and the takeover of Soviet revisionism around 1953. You should compare the reforms to the reforms, not compare the Chinese reforms to the Soviet Union's collapse. It doesn't make sense. The Soviet Union after 1953, although different from modern day China in many ways, is what marked the significant beginning of capitalist restoration in the Soviet Union. To make matters worse for the Soviet Union, there was no cultural revolution like what we saw in China. Therefore, these phenomena, linked with the reality of Soviet social imperialism that later developed and the Cold War, is what led to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the detachment of the party from the masses. As a Maoist and historical materialist, it's important to recognize that capitalism didn't restore itself in Russia suddenly in 1990, but that there were material conditions that existed from even before the Bolshevik Revolution and the Soviet Union's mishandling of some of these contradictions that influenced the development and eventual reversal of Soviet socialism in 1953 and the eventual collapse of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1990. Capitalism was already restored before the Soviet Union collapsed. The restoration of capitalism in China shares many similarities with the revisionism we saw in Russia, but due to the difference in how its class struggle developed, i.e. like the existence and influence of the cultural revolution among the masses, and due to a different global climate than existed when the Soviet Union still existed, Chinese revisionism has grown and developed in many different ways. Therefore, to compare the collapse of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union to Dengist reforms in 1978 doesn't make any sense whatsoever. In his glorification of China's development, he also ignores the reality that with a growing middle class and growing bourgeoisie in China, it also means that there is a really poor proletariat that is carrying society on its back. Capitalist development automatically entails inequality, and there are many studies outlining China's growing internal inequality, which he himself even refers to. It shouldn't surprise us that revisionists don't really have a class analysis in any concrete manner and in turn adopt the capitalist myth that development for development's sake is always positive no matter what. The Soviet Union also saw a sharp rise in its GDP and also became the second largest economy during its heyday, but as communists, this alone does not suffice for a country to be socialist. State capitalism has an advantage over other forms of capitalism because regulation becomes easier since everything is centralized. This is why China has been able to not be as affected by the crises of capitalism in the same way as America or Canada or, or other European countries. But with that said, there was some stock market turbulence in 2015 to 16 that without a doubt is a sign that China is not immune to these boom and bust cycles. The West blew this turbulence in China's stock market out of proportion because, you know, they're always trying to find every little error in China's dealings with global politics or with its economy in order for it to fail so that they can win. 
But at the end of the day, China is not indestructible. We also have to keep in mind that China is a very young capitalist nation when compared to the West. So we shouldn't see China's economic growth as some immutable truth that will never change. There was a recent study which I thought was really interesting. And I think it sort of highlights the qualitative difference of China's social formation from capitalist social formations. It was a study by the I think the World Inequality Report, it was conducted by a series of economists, including Thomas Piketty. It found that in China, while uh, inequality also increased, the living standards of the vast majority of people also increased, reflecting this poverty alleviation. In fact, real income for the bottom 50% of wage earners increased by 401% since 1978. In comparison, in the neoliberal United States, that's for that same strata of the population, real income decreased by 1%. We also see wages soaring in China. Uh, across the labor force as a whole, hourly incomes now exceed every major Latin American state except for Chile. Um, they're approaching the levels of the weaker European countries. Uh, social security and social supports and healthcare are constantly expanding. And the Communist Party at least states, and if we, it's also seemed to be demonstrating in action, that it's moving towards universalizing healthcare, universalizing education, social supports. Um, infrastructure construction uh, is really tremendous. They invest more in infrastructure than the US and Europe combined. They've built the world's largest bullet train network. This part is kind of funny because he basically equates socialism with rising inequality. Rising inequality in conjunction with rising living standards is actually characteristic of America's economic development if you look at the development of American capitalism over time. Keynesianism also played a role in this, but that's because the ruling class was responding to events in the global class struggle, such as the Bolshevik Revolution and the growth of communist parties and other leftists calling for revolution and fundamental change during and after the Great Depression hit. Wages rising in China should also be explained via the class struggle given that workers there do go on strike and organize against capitalist interests. This is the same reason why wages rose in America, and even though they've declined or stagnated since the 1970s and the rise of neoliberalism, wages are still relatively higher in America than in poorer countries, which is why they export capital to find cheap labor, just like China has been doing in recent times. This is actually a feature of capitalism wherever it develops into capitalist imperialism. If you're going to compare China's economic development since its inception as independent in 1949 to America's economic development, then you have to compare China's development since 1949 to America's development since 1783 and look at America when it was younger since China is also a younger economy. You have to look at the whole picture and not just single out the neoliberal era as if it didn't develop out of the reaction to stronger trade unions and a stronger left in general. Mind you, China opened its markets up to the imperialist powers right when neoliberalism was on the rise. So China's ruling class actually benefited largely from neoliberalism and was very much intertwined with neoliberalism right from the beginning. The sad part about China's development has been that it was significantly more equal during the Maoist era and is now reversing towards the inequality present when it was still a semi-capitalist and semi-feudal country, whereas America never came out of a socialist transition whatsoever. I found the study he's referring to and in it they delineate how the level of inequality used to be closer to that of Nordic social democratic countries but is increasingly becoming closer to inequality in America by a very huge margin. And Ajit somehow forgot to mention this point in his interview. There's nothing inherently socialist about this trend of growing inequality in conjunction with a rise in living standards, because as I stated earlier, socialism is moving towards communistic social relations that are more equal. Rising inequality is a result of capitalism. Even if you want to talk about standard of living rising, the quote unquote standard of living, however that's determined, in America is high yet we have an epidemic of drug usage, uh, poverty, and much much more among the downtrodden working class. We also have to take a hard look at how standard of living is even understood by capitalists and you know what categories are we even using to determine it. Usually it's just a measure of general wealth available to people in a society. This is ultimately a capitalistic category, 
whereas a socialist understanding of standard of living should go deeper than that because it's informed by social relations. Healthcare, housing, and the like would definitely need to be important to the development of socialism and within socialism, but isn't inherently socialist unless social relations are moving towards communist social relations. What he's explaining sounds more like imperialist social democratic countries than anything else. Is what he's saying a positive development? No, it's a capitalist development. His comparing America to China here is also sloppy, given that China is at the very early stage of its economic development as an independent country, whereas the United States has developed very differently as an independent country due to its being further down the road of a capitalist imperialist development and the fact that it's a significantly older capitalist economy. There are many similarities when looking at China's development and America's, but there are also many differences. For one, China is engaging imperialistically with countries via a more neoliberal model than America was in its earlier stages. This is why its military apparatus isn't as robust worldwide, but it's certainly beginning to be a hegemonic force in South Asia and Africa. Anytime you look at China, you see constant innovations, uh, really uh, staggering infrastructure projects. Uh, Greenpeace recently reported that China installs m more sa solar panels, enough solar panels to cover a football pitch every hour of every day. And it's becoming a world leader in environmental sustainability. It uh, leads the world in renewable energy production, renewable energy employment. It's making these technologies more affordable worldwide because of the scale of their investment. Um, and uh, I think all of this together indicates that this is a country which still um, is able to prioritize social and political needs of its population, of the vast majority of people, over uh, capital. Like, capital does not go above political authority in China. It still uh, constitutes this, what Marx calls the dictatorship of the proletariat. I don't think this has changed, and I think this social practice uh, indicates this. The dictatorship of the proletariat isn't merely social welfare programs or rising wages. Imperialist countries also have these to varying degrees. We have to have a class analysis that looks at the political, cultural, and economic spheres to recognize that social relations in China are fundamentally capitalist. Since the end of Mao's leadership, the party truly emphasized production and enrichment. Not only that, but on the cultural and ideological side of things in the movie Wolf Warrior 2, which was one of the highest grossing films in Chinese history on the cultural front. In this movie, China is depicted as the savior of Africa in a very paternalistic, militaristic, and imperialistic manner. What's especially daunting is that every movie in China has to pass through party channels before it's allowed to be released, and this movie is particularly patriotic. And there have been many other cases where where Chinese media has depicted China-African relations to be of a very paternalistic nature, where they depict themselves as the saviors of Africa in the very similar way as to how Americans see themselves as the savior of the world. And this is a very imperialistic attitude that is developing. Some leftists point to the Chinese crackdown on Maoists inside their borders, including past examples of China shutting down leftist websites as an indication that the Chinese state is objectively revisionist, if not full-blown counter-revolutionary. Um, how do you respond to this criticism, and why has the Chinese state actively worked against Maoists and other leftist movements, in your opinion? Mm hmm one, what we do know about internal Chinese political dynamics is very little. And so it's hard to really form conclusions based on like some random internet report on a website of people claiming to be leftists or Maoists or whatever. So I wouldn't preface it with that. But I think like regardless of that, I think how you view the situation depends on how you view the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party of China. If you consider the Communist Party of China uh, or in the People's Republic of China to be capitalist and or revisionist and counter-revolutionary or imperialist or not a progressive force, you're going to think that people who identify, the people that are trying to uh, maybe undermine that party or uh, even some of these uh, Maoists call for the overthrow of the Communist Party of China, you're going to think that's a progressive thing if that's your analysis of the situation. But if you think China, the Communist Party of China is socialist uh, and China's pursuing socialist construction and is a revolutionary society, you would think that people that are 
in universities trying to call for the overthrow of the Communist Party of China, I don't think you'd consider them revolutionary. This part of the interview is the most daunting because instead of engaging with the reality that China has cracked down on Maoists, not only within its borders, but also outside of it, i.e. selling weapons to the Duterte government in the Philippines, knowing that Duterte is currently in conflict with Filipino Maoists, he jumps instantly to idealism. This argument is idealist in that he defines this contradiction by saying, well, uh, it's how you see the situation. If you think China is this, then you'll think this. And whereas if you think China is that, then you'll think that. But that's a given that doesn't actually answer the question or explain why people might think China is capitalist or imperialist based on its activity internally and externally. As Marxists, we should start with the reality and work our way up from there, not by suggesting that ideas are just floating in the sky somewhere and you pick what you want based on how you feel. And this is where his liberalism becomes more apparent if it hasn't been apparent already enough. We have to look at the concerns of these Maoists in China or outside of China related to the material conditions that they're going through in relation to China or that Chinese workers and people are going through in relation to the Chinese state and not start from the idea that China is socialist just because we like it and then attempt to prove it's socialist by ignoring what is inconvenient for your idea. This right opportunism and revisionism is fundamental to how certain so-called Marxists actually understand global realities and the class struggle. We don't make analyses based on simply believing this or that view. We analyze as much information as possible and interpret from there in order to understand how to build revolution and communism. And again, he falls into simplifying this argument as coming from Western leftists instead of being a Marxist and looking at the works of Maoists that criticize China that aren't from the West. This is him being selective and brutally idealist. Western leftists, I think, do have to grapple with their own histories of uh, paternalism, of chauvinism, uh, holier-than-thou uh, idealism, frankly, that they've generally attributed towards actually existing socialist states. Um, this is something we see not only in China, but we saw with the Soviet Union. Yeah, and the Soviet Union no longer exists because of revisionism. Anyways, I could easily break down every single segment of that interview, but I think you get the general gist of my argument by now. What we need to recognize is that productivism, or the idea that development and technology is the motor of history, or that socialism needs to develop its quote-unquote material basis before it can think about moving towards communism, is actually counter to what we've seen based on the real experience of world historical revolutions in China and the USSR and elsewhere. The USSR didn't collapse because it didn't have enough technology and production and development. It collapsed because the class struggle was won by the capitalist class within the Soviet Union and within China. This idea of productivism historically has been the sign of a growing state bourgeoisie and the restoration of capitalist relations to the elimination of socialist or growing communist relations. I'm not suggesting that we can jump to communism overnight, but that we have to place the propagation of socialist or communist social relations at the forefront if we really want to build a world where, you know, everyone can benefit. China, based on the examples I've provided, is a capitalist state and a growing imperialist power. There's not one example of China fostering communist or socialist forms of labor where their workers are managing enterprises like they were during China's revolutionary era. Production relations have to be talked about. The current party merely sees the cultural revolution as a mistake and therefore fails to see anything positive in the reality that communism on a fundamental level means the workers liberating themselves with the help of the party. Although development and economics is important, it should be in command of a revolutionary political line that permeates all spheres of society and deliberately tries to undo the permeation of capitalist relations. Productive forces should be subjugated to a proletarian line that seeks to eliminate the bourgeoisie as a class, and in China this is no longer the case. This has not been the reality in modern day China, and the Chinese state is even spreading capitalism in Africa and elsewhere as we speak, 
and making African nations, as well as other countries in South Asia, dependent on Chinese capital. They sometimes give better deals to the host country, but this is because they're smart and trying to best American deals and interests since they're competing with America. Anyways, this is essentially my argument. I mean, there's a lot more aspects and things that I could have talked about. If you want to hear a little bit more of this argument, you can see my interview with Rev Left Radio, where Brett asked me some questions in regards to this, and I gave as best as possible a response as I could have at the time, given the time restraints. So this was my attempt to kind of expand that argument. But even this expansion has been limited because I'm still restrained by time. But anyways... If you want to find us, you can go on onmasspodcast.com and you could also look for us on Patreon, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and most other podcast outlets. You'll be able to find us. In terms of Patreon, it would help a lot if people could donate because, you know, this does take a lot of work, especially these episodes where I take it upon myself speak on a particular topic you know because i have to do a lot of reading and research and things like that so any support would mean a lot and the support has been great and i really appreciate it and i hope i can continue to create good content that you like if you have any suggestions for episodes or any suggestions in general just let me know and i'll do my best to respond and do my best to improve upon what i do my name is mubarak and this is on mass